Hello, welcome to this episode of Let's Talk Death. I'm Fran Solomon. And I'm Andy McNeil. And we're thrilled to be your host for these conversations. Let's Talk Death is brought to you by Heal Grief, a social support network creating community after someone has died. Everything we do is inspired by our core belief that no one should ever grieve alone. Our goal with this program is to have a friendly chat with some amazing people so we can help normalize and educate our Heal Grief community. Our guest today is Guy Casablanca. Guy is a co-founder of Grief Leaders, a training and consulting organization devoted to educating leaders on how to help grieving employees excel at work. Guy is a duly licensed funeral director and mortician and has experience facilitating healthy grieving processes. Guy has owned two businesses, consulted for corporations, and led teams of managers. He currently manages a funeral home in Loveland, Colorado, and is co-author, along with his brother Anthony, of The Dying Art of Leadership, How Leaders Can Help Grieving Employees Excel at Work. Guy, we are delighted to have you as our guest. Not as delighted as I am to be here. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to meet you both. Thank you. So um, our listeners really like to um, understand the connection one may have with the work that they're doing. Um, So if you wouldn't mind sharing with us, is there a particular death loss that led you into your field and your writings? Yes, uh, absolutely. It it really, it started um, in the 1980s, actually, and launched my career into funeral service when my father suddenly passed of pancreatic cancer when I was just 18 years old. Now, as uh, anyone knows, that's a very pivotal time in a teenage boy's life when he needs the most direction he can possibly be afforded by his parents and especially his father figure. Um, And what got me into the business, Fran, was a wonderful funeral director who handled my father's service. He came by our house to deliver the death certificates to us and asked, you know, guy, what are you what are you going to do now? You're out of high school. You're you're you got the your whole life in front of you. What what are you going to do? And my response was, well, I kind of need a job. I got to start there. I need a job. So he offered me a job at the funeral home. And I started just like any other apprentice, mowing lawns and pulling weeds and parking cars. But the more that I got involved in the the in-depth part of the business, the more I fell in love with it and it it became my career. So it it was really, um, it was really kind of sentimental and very touching because it was almost like my father's final gesture to me was to launch my career because he was not going to be there to guide me through the next phases of my life. So that's what got me into the industry. And it's, uh, it's been a part of my life ever since. Very powerful, very powerful story. And um, you, you recently wrote a book. What inspired you and your brother to write the book? And um, again, for our viewers, The Dying Art of Leadership, How Leaders Can Help Grieving Employees Excel at Work. Yes. So the answer to that is twofold. I'll I'll answer it from both sides of the the spectrum. For myself, as a funeral director and mortician, I have dealt with literally scores, hundreds of people whom I have nurtured through the grieving process and I've gotten them through the funeral process and and gotten them on a path towards healthy grieving. But I hear it time and time again, they're just not ready to go back to work. Not necessarily because they are trapped in the depths of grief, but because they dread what they are facing when they get back to work, whether that be because of a poor corporate corporate culture or the very nature of grief itself interfering with their productivity at work. So I hear that story time and time and time again. My brother, likewise, from a leadership perspective, as he has been in leadership positions for a couple of decades, 
he too has suffered very personal losses and has witnessed this happen at the workplace where people come back to work and are not emotionally prepared to deal with what they have, their obligations on their desk, so to speak. And the leadership has never been appropriately trained to adapt their human resources leadership style to accommodate that person's needs when they're in the depths of grief. So the two of us together recognize that this is, this is an ongoing problem that is not being addressed. And it is literally costing this country billions of dollars a year in lost productivity due to, I'll say grief situations, but it's really any emotional trauma whatsoever. Grief can come in many forms, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, interesting. Um, one of the other things that, that I might suggest people are not ready to face are the, I, I, I hate to use the word insensitivity because I think that implies that someone is attempting to be insensitive, but just the lack of appropriate response someone might get from their coworkers just because they don't know what to do and they don't know what to say and they don't know how to be supportive. Right. We, we have witnessed a lot of people return to work who tell me personally, people are walking away from me yeah. at work because they just don't know what to say. And my closest colleagues, my closest coworkers, my closest friends are keeping a safe distance from this topic because they just don't know what to say. And that's part of what we actually cover in our book are things you can say and what not to say to, to help that person feel more comfortable at work. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've heard this time and time again. I, you, are, you are correct. This is so desperately needed. I'm, I'm glad that you wrote the book and, and I'm looking forward to reading it myself. I, grief in the workplace grief is it's not, it, it, it is, is behind in, in, our, in our society, um, even, even to the point of uh, bereavement leave and uh, just understanding people's needs around grief. Uh, and, it, it, and again, it may not just be the death of someone. It could be other challenges and changes that people are going through. I've seen it with people in society who are caring for an ailing loved one, an older loved one, and they're having to be the caregiver and the stress of they work all day and then they come home and care all night, right? And that taking a toll, it's, it's how do we get, I think as you said, Guy, how do we get not just their work, their work mates, their peers at work, but the leaders, the managers and, and, the ones who really set that infrastructure and that culture, how do we, how do we shape that? Um, what are ways that we are able to, to do that? That's, that's, that's the big question, right? Um, and, and before I get to that, because I, I want to touch on something that you said, I'd like to share a couple of statistics with you that we have revealed through the course of our research at Grief Leaders. Um, it is estimated, according to the Grief Recovery Institute, from a study that they did in 2003, that there is $75 billion a year in lost productivity due to emotionally traumatized workers having to return to the workforce. Now, that's 2003. This is pre-COVID, pre-lockdown, pre-economic downturn, right? Pre traumatic events that have taken, captured yeah. our society, Las Vegas Danny. massacre, right. on and on and on. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. There, there are, there are about 2.8 million deaths a year. There are about 2.4 million divorces a year. There are about 1.7 million cancer diagnoses a year. There are 10 million opioid addictions a mm. year. Now you put that all together, you're talking about 17 million people who are undergoing some kind of emotional trauma in their lives. If that emotional trauma only affects one other person in their life, we're talking about 34 million people a year who are struggling through their day-to-day -day routine at work 
in order to try and deal with this. When you take into the realistic uh, account that it's probably affecting three or four people in every one of those instances, the exponential factor in that number becomes absolutely staggering. And the $75 billion a year in losses is, is suddenly now upwards of $100 billion plus. So it is, it is a, a pandemic in and of itself, right? It's a pandemic within a pandemic. And part of the way that, that we want to see the, culprit, the corporate culture change is to make people feel more comfortable and, and safer at work, more nurtured, um, to not have to hide their grief as they work through their day. And that takes uncomfortable conversations. It takes a lot of courage as a leader to come forward, close someone's door, and speak one-on-one -on -one with them in very compassionate tones and with a very sincere understanding to know where they are in their grieving process so that you can adapt your human resource leadership style to accommodate their needs at work. And I could, it, it would be chapters and chapters of discussion to tell you how we go about doing that. But there are very deliberate methods in which we create a matrices to gauge where someone is on the, first of all, the grief Richter scale and how it's affecting their performance at work so that we can make changes as leaders on a one-on-one -on -one basis because everybody's a little different. Everybody grieves a little differently we can make individual changes to make sure that we're accommodating them and they can excel. And furthermore, that they feel like they are nurtured and cared for at work. And I think that's where corporate America is really falling short because we've been trained not to bring these issues to work. We've been taught to leave them at home and that just doesn't work. You know, it's interesting, a uh, movement, um, I want to say maybe about a decade ago in the corporate workforce was recognizing the needs of new mothers and what that means and the adaptation that corporations made to provide opportunity for mothers or fathers to bring their Tod infant toddler into the workplace and and I, I think this is similar in the sense that the movement needs to happen with so many grieving individuals there needs to be an apt adaptation and an understanding of the needs because I also feel that someone who is grieving has an unrealistic expectation of what society places upon them that you should be getting over this. Well, we know that, that that's just not realistic. And, and so for the employee two, three, four months later to even feel as though they can be expressive to their supervisor the concern may be my supervisor might think I'm not well and there's something wrong with me when in yeah. fact it's very normal. Absolutely. These people are often judged as though they have uh, performance issues and it's not a performance issue. That person is not a performance problem. They have a stress issue. They have a grief issue and that can be adapted to that can be overcome that that does not necessarily mean they need to be walked back and recoached on a set of processes or or standards at work it means that you need to dial in your leadership model to accommodate what they're going through maybe alleviate them of some of their tasks or maybe you need to exercise a little more follow up to make sure that everything is done correctly um you know I interestingly enough Fran, and you guys may have witnessed this yourself, but there are some people who become hyper-focused mm -hmm. when they're in grief, right? Because it's almost a coping mechanism and a way to keep their mind out of their grief and, and keep them out of their own internal dialogue is to shift into this hyper-focused mode of work. Well, that person is going to have a different set of parameters that we adjust to help coach them through their grief at work. They may not need as much um, 
they, they may be able to keep the amount of stewardship that you generally uh, uh, put upon them at work. They might need a little more follow-up. They might need a little more communication. But as far as taking over the task, he's got it. He's got it. Other people, they may not need much follow-up, but man, you got to give them a very deliberate set of instructions on what to do because they just can't pull all the pieces together to, to put together a, a plan of attack for a project that they have. But if you give them that plan of attack, man, they can run with it, right? Yeah. So it, it's all about adaptation. I find grief to be one of the few social issues left to be addressed in a, law, in, in a very broad embracing scale. We yeah. don't want to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> then we are. Yeah, yeah. Great, yeah, here we and here we are talking about it exactly. Well, guy, so, we. Well, I, I, I was just. I want to ask. So, what three tips would you have for leaders who are listening, who may have a grieving employee working with them right now? Yeah, that that's a great question. Um, the simplest, the the easy answer to that is communicate, 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 communicate and allow your employees to be as open and expressive as they feel they need to be and are comfortable being with you at work. Number two, um, I, I would say the number two quality that is imperative to this success is vulnerability. Leaders don't like to express their own vulnerability, right? They, they're, they're supposed to be the strong ones, the, the impervious of the group. Expressing your vulnerability creates a camaraderie that produces longevity and dedication to the company. And it creates a culture where people feel like they are safe because they're not alone, right? They're not alone in their grief. Somebody gets it. So th those are two of the biggest tips that I could, I could give someone. Um, the third kind of comes in an analytical fashion. You really have to analyze what is on this person's plate, what they're dealing with, because not all losses are equal, yet a loss is a loss is a loss. You had mentioned um, uh, new mothers returning to work. And although that is not necessarily a grief scenario, it is an emotional stress scenario which can, which can portray itself in the same ways that someone who's suffering a loss is yeah. the things that they're going through, right? So you really have to fine tune your, um, your intuitiveness as to what someone's needs are in order to accommodate their day and make them more productive. More yeah. compassionate world. More compassionate world. Well, Guy, um, we only have a few minutes left, but I want to give you an opportunity. Uh, quite often, our time just flies by. It always does. The conversations are always, always pretty quick. But this has been a great one. Um, uh, those who are watching uh, quite often want to know how they can connect with our guests. So how might people connect with you and your work? Um, how, how might they do that? In your book. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Well, thank you for asking. There's a couple of ways. Uh, you can go out to griefleaders.com. Uh, in fact, we would love it if our listeners would share their personal stories of grief and loss and returning to the workplace with us on that website. Your feedback means the world to us. Uh, um, it, is, it is imperative to us that we understand what people are going through on a day-to-day -day basis. So you can connect with us there on the website, griefleaders.com. We are also on LinkedIn at Grief Leaders, where we will field any questions that you have. You can message us there, and we will try and respond to you just as quickly as we can. And you can also pick up a copy of our book, The Dying Art of Leadership, uh, available on Amazon and at Book Baby. You can also find it through the website. There will be links there that will lead you right to it. Wonderful. Great. And we'll have a link um, on our episode as well for our viewers and listeners. Thank you. So, Guy, again, we want to thank you for being a guest here at Let's Talk Death and for sharing the inspiration behind your book and your great work. Thank you.
Thank you very much for having me. It's been an honor to make your acquaintance. And thank you guys for all that you do on a day-to-day -day basis in regards to this topic. Your work is so very valued and needed. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. And thank you to all those joining the, us for this episode of Let's Talk Death. If you want to learn more about Heal Grief, please visit us at healgrief.org. At healgrief.org, you can learn more about all of the programs and resources of Heal Grief. You can learn about our national network for supporting grieving young adults called Actively Moving Forward. You can learn about our app communities where you can find support uh, for your grief and the situations you might be dealing with. Make sure to sign up on HealGrief.org to receive our newsletter for links to future episodes of Let's Talk Death. And so again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Let's Talk Death.